Now, ladies and gentlemen, the transition of Mullally's backyard by Leo Cullen of Sunday Miscellany fame. My glasses broke with all the excitement coming here, and meeting all these people. It wasn't that, it was nothing to do with you, you beautiful looking people, it was me. Um, <clears throat> so, oh yeah, before I get caught up in the story, does <clears throat> anyone know who that is? <laughs> Remember a man by the name of Horn? Not Linny. Not Linny. Not Linny. Christy. Christy Harney drove the cattle around the ring. <coughs> Christy Horn. Great name for a cattle man. <coughs> now, just listening to you all, and I'm sure everybody down there in the audience also is thinking, God, I, I have a story to tell about that one. I remember that. I remember something about that. I have a story to tell about that. It was happening to me all through the time uh, that I was listening uh, to, to you all. Um, and I know, so, I know some of the people here too, and it's great. Uh, I, a, a Joe's story actually brings me back to the cinema because as I read mine, you will see that it is heavily influenced, in fact, by the cinema. <laughs> um, and the story of... The, um, the rugby team. I, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just go off track for one moment. My father, <coughs> Leo Cullen, Lally's Hotel, uh, was a great rugby man himself. He went to school in, in Blackrock College and he played rugby and uh, he was a, a hooker. Uh, he was good. Um, and when he came back to Temple Moor, I don't know at what stage the, um, the rugby club was in at that, at that time. But he decided anyway, he'd get a crowd of, I, I don't think he called people from Black Rock Gurriers, but he got a crowd of Gurriers who had passed pupils of Black Rock down to play against a Temple Moor 15. And he, I was only a little fella, and it was up near the railway someplace. There was a, there was a field up there, yeah, yeah. And it was a shocking, wet, mucky, rainy day. <clears throat> and my father, of course, was the referee. But he had no whistle. He, he wasn't a great man for preparing himself. So he borrowed a guard's whistle from Guard Marnell. And you know the sound of the guard's whistle to drive anyone bonkers. So the match started and Daddy was blowing the horn and blowing the horn and blowing the It was a horn society. It was more like a horn than a, than a whistle. And I think that the it seemed to be a scrum nearly the whole time during the game. Muck and S-H-I-T-E and scrum, just the whole time during the game. And uh, at one stage, Daddy disappeared. In fact, he, I'm not too sure which team it was, but they got fed up of him blowing the whistle and some fella pulled him in under the scrum. And the next time I saw him, he was black and blue and battered. <laughs> and I was... a. A very sad little boy seeing it happen. That was my father and the rugby's, rugby. And that, you, remind, you remind me of that, Pat. Um, this is called The Transition of Mullally's Backyard. That's the hotel backyard. <clears throat> this is a memory of youth. Do not forsake me, oh my darling. These were the words of a song that drifted through the kitchen window and out onto the backyard of Mullally's Hotel. The girls in the kitchen played the radio all day long. The men worked in the yard. Me, with my cowpoke friend, Jimmy Kelly, we spotted Indians out there. From the same radio one Saturday came commentary of the Grand National won by Queer Times, bred nearby at Orwell Stud by Phil Sweeney. The men crouched outside the window shouting and I could smell their excitement. I could smell gravy from the kitchen, suet from the butchers which also backed onto the yard, beer and corks from, cattling, from the bottling sheds, as I cattling, <laughs> there was a bottling shed there as well, from the bottling shed, moonshine from the empty John Powered bottles dumped outside the bar. 
I was drunk from it all. I knew every smell, taste and shout. Even from the beginning I did. When, as a baby in the pram parked in the yard, I saw shafts of sun and heard tweets of yard birds, blue tits and sparrows that old Annie Connolly from Cozy Bank Street fed every day with crumbs thrown from the balcony. I didn't, of course, know Annie at the beginning, just the warbling of the birds. I didn't know the vroom vroom sound was my father's Chevrolet clocking 90 leaving the yard, or the squeak was the rusty handle turning the, edgy sto the edging stone to sharpen the butcher's knives. I was growing up the son of the emperor then, and I didn't know it. In the lower part of the yard stood a hay barn filled with straw and turf and dogs and cats. Um, a sheepdog named Sneem lived there. He came from Kerry. He was the same colour as a sod of turf, and he looked like one too until you tried to lift him. And then he had a tongue and teeth, and you felt the electricity of hair and tail and danger against your back legs as, they, as he bolted past you. The other dog was a terrier named Rossi, a mean critter who also came from Kerry, so that I thought that all dogs came from Kerry. <laughs> <clears throat> the enormous horses were down there, in the stonework stables about the perimeter of the yard. My mother's, bay, my mother's bay mare, named Mayo, was one. My mother groomed Mayo with her curry comb and dandy brush and sang, Let him go, let him tarry. A horse called New Hope came there for quiet holidays, so that behind his stable door he could be given private injections into his fat veins and then he'd race faster. <laughs> At the far end of the, gar of, the, of the yard was the garage for the hearse and the loft above it where Taylor with the top hat made coffins for Boot Hill. A furious crinkling of wood shavings came from there. Though it was in reality a quiet place where Taylor planed his coffins and Paddy Barry polished his hearse and sang, and sang Come Back Paddy Riley to Bally James Duff. And my sister Carmen and I sometimes got into the coffins for Taylor and lay side by side so that Taylor could see if they'd accommodate the fattest man or woman that might die in the town. <laughs> <clears throat> the slaughterhouse was down there too. Bullocks with heads going over and back as though they were lost were driven down the yard, past the horses and dogs. A bull ring was clamped in their nostrils. The horse, sorry, the rope from the bull ring went through a ring in the ground, and then the men pulled. Seamus Farley from Eden Derry, <coughs> Fochna Mellet from Kilfenora, an Annie handyman down there at the time, and sometimes my father too. And when the bullock was inched along, his nose tipped the ground, and his tongue was coming out to lick it, the gun was put to his head, and the next thing he collapsed in a huddle and the chains hoisted him up and he was skinned and the knife went through him and out burst a steaming pot potpourri that made a map of Europe on the floor. <coughs> and this is the part of the story, not for Sunday miscellany <coughs> on a family Sunday morning. They don't like blood. <coughs> Further again, down the yard, where all remained serene, there was the hotel garden with bluebells and roses, where John Kelleher came and snoozed and snored and snows, sorry, S N W O Z E and snoozed on the tiny lawn between milk, his morning and evening milkings of his dairy cows of Shorthorn and Frisians. There was a house down there of the long-nosed pigs who squealed when Bucky came with the, hotel snop, with the hotel slops. And then they grunted back to sleep again. 
There were the sleepy drills where Joe Davy, whose brother was Tommy, who owned the pub, dug potatoes, and a field that went as far back as the Christian Brothers' high wall, Joe Davy. Every time the Angelus rang, he leaned his forehead on the handle of the spade like it was his final nail. It was. A day came. When after the turn of my sister Carmen to nap in the pram in the early 50s, and then the turn of the twins, a quiet new baby was napping in the pram, and instead of my mother and nurse who came from Kerry of the Dogs, should stood shotgun over it, and everything changed. A while after that, nine citizens moseyed every evening along the narrow corridor of the part of the hotel where the Cullen family lived. Quiet Bank Street was outside the window. They were considerable citizens. Buckley, the creamery manager. Harney, the cattleman. Walsh, the auctioneer, John's father. Cunningham, who looked like Gary Cooper, but instead of sheriff, was solicitor. <laughs> Burks, Ryans, my father's cousin Willie, and my father too, who was the smallest, I have to say. Me in my pyjamas and bare feet going to bed along the corridor, avoiding ten tons of important flesh in leather shoes. They had come there to change the world. The committee, as they say in Cork, sorry, the committee of Templemore Livestock Mart, they decided during powwows in our small nursery that our yard would be the place where the change in world affairs would happen. A cattle mart it would be, the second in all of Munster. One day, I'd saunter down the yard and the slaughterhouse would be gone. Another day, where were Barry and Taylor and the coffins? Alarming. New Hope was sent to Father Sweeney's for holidays. The turf shed blew away in the wind like Dorothy's house in the Wizard of Oz. Sneem, Rossi, sods of turf, garden bluebells, planks for coffins carried off in a prairie twister. But up rose the cattle mart. Cattle pens were made from Wild West Railway sleepers. Buyers and cattle, buyers and cattle came from far away Wyoming and Upper Church. <laughs> stables where horses, stables where horses had whinnied became a cattle stick toting saloon in which I drank lemonade with the drivers of the cattle truck highways who drank moonshine. I spoke to the Kenny brothers from Burris Lee and all the great horrors of Tipperary. I followed Christy Horner around the sales ring and mimicked his movement with cattle stick. Ho, ho, he said. <laughs> oh, how indeed. How does a town change? One way is a hotelier, come lots of other occupations, thinks up something big so as not to feel forsaken, oh my darling. He rounds up a posse of nine honchos. They build a cattle mart, the second in Munster, and the best. It is 1957. And then they, father and children, roll the wagon, leave Dodge City, and light out, and light out for the Cherokee Indian territory around Killinall, where there will be plenty more powwows, I can assure you. I did go back to Dodge City on odd occasions, but once did not. But once they had knocked a hole, the size the, along the side of Bank Street, 
to facilitate the cattle droves and the double-decker trucks. The yard spilled out through it like that bullock's insides and was never mine again, except in memory. The yard and all its OK corrals now belonged to Dodge City or Temple Moor. And I'm okay with that too. <laughs>